what? was in fact the cabin altitude warning alarm. Oh my Although god! Sound exactly the same. Where the alarm sounds indicates which it is. And when it sounds off in the air, it means one thing and one thing only. That there this is went an off when we were in the simulator. Because I forgot to turn on the, the, the packs. But like, it went off in the simulator and it's gone off in flight simulator multiple times. The degree of negligence is insane here. Austin, you need to pay attention to this 100%. On the this is real horror. Helios flight 522. How a single switch killed 121 passengers. Okay. Austin, there's no way. I brought, I brought famous flight correspondent, professional flightist, trying to post a flighter an story. Okay, Austin, are you familiar with this flight? Reputation, right? Not redemption. No, I'm not. But I'm ready to focus right here. Okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Are you? I'm ready. Are you familiar with this flight? <laughs> no, but I'm going Before to speculate get, what happened. What do you think happened? I don't know yet because I don't know what happened. 14th of August, 2005, at 7.30 a.m. Helios Airways Flight 522, a flight scheduled to travel from Cyprus to Prague via Athens, was stuck on a loop 35,000 feet in the sky, and there had been no communication from the plane for over an hour. A in loop. a state of confusion, the Greek army sent two F-16 fighter jets to investigate, but as one of the pilots glanced a view inside the aircraft, they saw that disaster was about to unfold, because the pilots were nowhere to be seen. They were about to witness one of the worst airplane disasters in European history. That's strange. And it left... The pilots were nowhere to be seen is a ghost plane, I assume. I think I think they locked themselves out of the cockpit. That's insane. Well, that's what I would speculate with this if the pilots weren't in the cockpit. Or they were slouched over the controls, which means that they experienced a phenomenon called hypoxia. Yeah, no, that's why I said ghost plane. the was depressurized. For, for the record, just so everybody knows, that's a ghost plane is a different uh, layman's term for what uh, Austin is describing. Where the cabin depressurizes... And, um, and if you don't have enough time, I guess, to, to put on your oxygen mask, which, uh, pilots actually have like a full blown oxygen mask. Um, they don't put it on in time. They will pass out. Is it reputation? Everyone on the ground with one question. What happened to Helios flight? people on board. We saw no pilot in the cockpit. If they saw no pilot in the cockpit, they said actually the FO was visible. Banging noise. That's the cabin pressure. The story of Helios Flight 522 began at 9 p.m. on Saturday, the 13th of August, 2005, when a Boeing 737 aircraft, nicknamed Olympia, departed London Heathrow for Larnaca, Cyprus. The plane was owned by Helios Airways, a low-cost Cypriot 800. airline that chartered flights between flew, Cyprus the and the rest of Europe. The flight was, initially, fairly uneventful. But then the crew heard something strange. A loud banging noise was coming from one of the plane's doors. Upon further inspection, it also seemed that the seal around the door was frozen. Following procedure, uh -oh. one of the flight's crew members made a note of the incident in the aircraft cabin defect log. And when the plane landed at Larnaca Airport at 1.25 a.m. local time... Oh, it landed? Those notes were passed this to the captain flight. for review, who personally Damn. spoke to the ground Good engineer King. team to we're ensure to a go. full inspection was carried out. And we are covering Helios Flight 522, how a single switch killed uh, 121 passengers. Uh, they heard a loud banging noise so far. They heard a loud banging noise. Here, pull up a chair. What is this? You don't want to You don't want to watch a, a, a fucking airplane video? Is it because... The shame you feel because we're looking at a 737-800 plane that def, de, def, uh, that, meant, that had a manufacturing error. Look at Marat's face. Look at how tan and red he is versus your face. Also, here, we'll put this in between both of you guys so you can... And then take off the noise gauge, so me? we're starting. You know you want and when the plane attention. landed at Larnaca Airport <laughs> at 1.25 a.m. local time, those notes were passed to the captain for review who personally spoke to the ground engineer team to ensure a full inspection was carried out. And with that, the crew left and a full inspection began. The man in charge of the inspection was 44-year-old Alan Irwin, 
a well-liked and hands-on engineer from the UK who had been hired by Helios Airways on a six-month contract. Following standard operating well procedure for yeah. a Boeing 737, I Alan agree. carried out a... Because his charisma and, and popularity probably allowed people to overlook uh, God, dude, his massive uh, error really here. That's a good point. That's, that, I would assume that's the reason why they mentioned it. Cabin Very pressurization valid. leak check to test the integrity of the door. To do this, he and his team needed to manually pressurize the plane while it was still on the ground. As part of that process, Alan switched something known as the pressurization mode selector located on the cockpit panel from auto to manual. It's right, important to remember that a plane... Uh, yeah, this all makes sense. All right, keep going. Also, why would you be the one who's speaking here instead of Murat? I feel like... I probably know more about this part of the plane than you do. I doubt Located I on the cockpit it. panel from auto to manual. Yeah, it's important sense. to remember uh -huh. that a plane's onboard pressurization system ensures that the plane is adequately oxygenated as True. it gains altitude. This is something that is always done automatically, but a manual option is available in order to perform on-the-ground tests. Yes. However, going through this process, Alan and the rest of his team <coughs> were unable to recreate the problem. And so, after carrying on with other routine checks, he noted down that there were no known defects, no leaks, and no <laughs> abnormal noises. Alan and the rest of his team felt that the onboard pressurization system was working just fine. This is the moment that starts off a chain of events that will seal the fate of everyone on board. He did not because the pressurization switch it mode back. selector had not been set back to auto. No! It was it stayed on manual. Mm -hmm. Big big fucking on Sunday, problem, the 14th mate. 14th of August, 2005 at 3:15 a.m. local time. The aircraft was released for its 6 a.m. flight to Prague via Athens. Fast forward to 5 a.m., the crew for flight 522 arrived an hour before departure to complete a standard pre-flight briefing. Due to staff sickness, there had been some difficulty in putting together a full crew. Luckily, two attendants, Luisa Volterra and Andreas Prodromo, were able to fill in last minute. Initially, Andreas was reluctant to join the crew, but you guys would eventually are going to leave, after yeah. discovering that his girlfriend, I'm also a flight Hawaiian attendant, barbecue. was serving as a member of Sounds the cabin good. crew on that particular flight, if you want, and I the can four flight attendant for us, and you eat here. But if you want to go out, I'm not <coughs> going to order for you. So I'm asking, I'm asking right now, would you like it? Austin's distracted. I personally have no preference. Marat wants to go out with me. No, he 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 has to sit here and answer for the crimes of Boeing. Okay. Okay. Would join 59-year-old okay. I'm kidding. I'm Hans kidding. I'm kidding. Martin and 51-year-old first officer Pampos Haralambos two experienced pilots with a collective 23,000 hours of flying experience between them. Mm. Together, this crew of six would... You're right there, you can't you can't let a Greek man fly the plane, you know? Can't be can't be the first officer, you know? There you go. 115 passengers, around a third of whom were children. As the cabin crew oh, yeah. were preparing oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. for takeoff, yeah. they knew that this would be an easy and short flight with experienced pilots. But what they didn't know is that Hans was fired three months earlier by British Airline Jet 2 for repeated failures to comply with standard procedures. In fact, nobody knows this, not even Helios themselves, because Hans' references were never asked for. On top of this, First Officer Pampos also has a record of rushing through checklists, and to make matters worse, the two pilots don't exactly see eye to eye. In fact, Pampos had complained multiple times about Hans' attitude and was actively seeking new employment. Nonetheless, as Wait. passengers began to board the plane, Pampos and Hans worked through their standard pre checklist. They don't checklist. fly together all the time. It is here that the string of catastrophic Maybe they do. Is continued. Oh. Pre flight checklists are lists of tasks that should be performed by pilots and That's aircrew an actual prior to takeoff. In the uh, cockpit, NG cockpit, pilots will be which working through multiple videos, lists designed actually. to ensure that all switches and indicators are that's in the an correct actual, positions. That's impressive. But Flight 522 was slightly behind schedule, and so. As both Hans and Pampos rushed through their that checklists, that's what we they both together. failed to register yeah. that the pressurization... I, I, I know how to fly this. Like, if I was on the plane, I would probably would have saved them. It's true. Honestly. Like, TFTI, dude. TFTI. Yeah. Selector <laughs> was still on manual. At 6.07 a.m., seven minutes behind schedule, the aircraft took Schedule. off from Larnaca Airport. For the first few minutes, it's actually everything pretty seemed much on perfectly schedule. normal. Right. Four minutes after takeoff, at 6.11 a.m., I'd like to comment. That's an incorrect statement. Most aircraft will push back. Their pushback time is 6 a.m., but they won't actually depart for about 
five to 15 minutes after their scheduled departure, still leaving them uh, as an on-time departure. Thank you. Um, Ground control cleared Flight 522 for a final cruising altitude of 34,000 feet, and the plane began its climb through the clear blue Cypriot sky. It should be said at this point that only the last few hours of- Not necessarily, no. Oh, do you fly a lot? Available. And so much of this story has been pieced together using Austin, the in-flight data don't know recorder, what the, on the ground like, recordings, and testimony, as well as clues from Greek the crash slash, site. Like, no, no. What this all shows I promise you, to the if the departure time is 6 a.m., they're not manual. taking off at 6 a.m. That is that is probably accurate. Yes. That's, it's almost, it's almost, it's almost po I'm almost positive because the door has to close X amount of time, time before departure time. It's the pushback time. I didn't realize we were doing... Departure time is the pushback we, time. I, we've officially hit a timeline <laughs> where we're doing two transformative uh the content has become too transformative your 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 new name is Paustin. <laughs> Paustin. all right the cabin was not automatically pressurizing meaning the air was getting thinner and there was increasingly less oxygen even though multiple indicators on the cockpit dashboard clearly showed that the altitude inside the cabin was abnormally high for some reason neither hans nor pampos two pilots with tens of thousands of hours of flight experience between them noticed at 12,000 I mean, feet and climbing pretty high yet another fatal and inexplicable error was okay how did they but not also the, the the pilots should like actually train for it yeah they're trained for it and they're the warning maybe been going maybe off. they were trained too hard for hypoxia therefore they were like they didn't even feel it because they were like well, oh they, they would have landed just fine okay you're right about that god damn it Shit, like they they actually do get hypoxia training to like yeah no I know to understand and recognize the symptoms. Mm -hmm. I know. Well, I guess like the point, the reason why it still happens all the time, regardless of the training, is not because that they're untrained, but the very nature of hypoxia is that you get a feeling of euphoria and can't really account for your condition at a, if it it's the the right point, right? Yeah, but like two guys probably don't have the exact same like point, right? You Hey, this guy next to me is acting kind of sus. Yeah. Anyway, I wasn't there. I don't know anything about this. They're too busy not. fighting, probably. It was seems. made when a loud alarm started sounding in the cockpit. That's because the, the pilots fucking... had missed the earlier signs. Huh. The cabin was not adequately pressurized. Are you kidding me? They misread this loud alarm as an erroneous takeoff configuration. What? Range. Oh in my other god! Words, a glitch. What? It was in fact the cabin altitude warning alarm. Oh my the god! Sound exactly the same. Where the alarm sounds indicates which it is, and when it sounds off in the air, it means one thing and one thing only. That there this is went an off when we were in the simulator with the cabin because I forgot to turn on the, uh, the the packs. But like, it went off in the simulator, and it's gone off in flight simulator multiple times. And what they're failing to tell you is on the iCast display, it literally says in red "cabin out" in red as the alarm is going off. There's no erroneous. They, 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 it literally tells you what the alarm is for. It says, Murat, do they have that on the 737? Yes. 800? Look up. I have no. Look idea. up cabin alt ICAST 737NG. Maybe Austin does know more than you. E I C A S. I think it's ICAST. Is that right? E E I C A S. E I C A S. Are you sure? Because yeah. ICAST came up. No. E I C A E. E I C. I don't know if it's if that's the right display, but hit E, e I. Yeah, there you go. That's it. Okay. Hit enter. Oh, maybe that's the wrong display. This one, more? No, the 737. Uh, maybe iCast isn't the right one. Uh, Any of these? What's the big screen? Is oh, it iCast? Wrong. wrong. The plan was a Boeing 737-31S? No, no, it was, it was a 737-800. It was an 800, I think. PF, no, not the primary flight display. It wouldn't, it wouldn't pop up on the... Pro what's, the, what's, the what's the name of the map where the map is? The GPS map is? Isn't, isn't it the iCast? Isn't that the altitude... Is it? It, uh, that's just a different type of just that's the max right there i think <laughs> oh mfd Go, look up a uh, uh, cabin alt mfd display okay what, you know what's it? funny about this okay let me tell you something okay maybe it seems that's like a it's a little bit more confusing than no it's you not gave these pilots it credit not. it is not it was a Boeing 737 uh, 31S. Oh. It wasn't an 800. Well, they put in the video, they showed an NG cockpit and they said 737-800. Oh, okay. Remember when we gave him props for like getting it right? Yeah. You did. They, Austin, they didn't, they didn't well, say he didn't they, know. He was just They watching. said it was a 737. Then they showed the 737-800 manual and they we showed reached, a 737-800 okay, cockpit. Uh, also, officially, we've reached new levels of autism that was previously unheard of on the stream. So that's... 
And somehow it's you that's hitting it and not Marat. Which Look, is surprising. I, I have no... Okay, the, 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 I'm not as familiar with the 737-300 displays, but it is it is very similar to the NG cockpit. It's just got older, more analog uh, instruments, and therefore they may not have got that. The they may not have got. They don't have that same alert. They may just get the audio noise, and then they have to try to associate that. The plane used the same sound for an alert on the ground and alert in the air for two different problems. This ah, was identified as one of the main ah, issues after the crash. Ah, okay, this makes sense. But see, in the NG, in the NG, it'll tell you what that alert is for, right? That, uh, uh, so that, that sound, they that, fixed that go, when, when you take off uh, 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 and you're not configured for takeoff, that sound will also sound, but it'll tell you on the screen what it's, what, what it's sounding for. Mm -hmm. That sound is also the same sound that you get when the cabin is depressurized. That's what the video said. If you were paying attention, you would have noticed that. ...and that oxygen masks should be worn immediately. Neither Hans nor Pampos <coughs> did this. Instead, at 6.14 a.m., Hans made a call down to the Helios dispatcher on the ground. At first, he mentioned the erroneous takeoff configuration warning, which was sounding in the cockpit. This confused the dispatcher because a takeoff configuration alarm cannot sound at 12,000 feet in the air. Yeah, and that's, so that's, that's, he handed that's a good, the call over to Alan Irwin, the on-duty ground engineer who had performed the plane's inspection earlier on in the day. But things became even stranger. When the captain began to radio down about a ventilation cooling system error, he stated that, quote, the ventilation cooling fan lights were off. Then, moments later, he directly contradicted himself. To Alan, who was listening in on the ground, the conversation was as confusing as it was bizarre. But perhaps, Alan thought, Hans is confusing two lights that sit closely together. <coughs> and it was at this point that he asked the captain about the pressurization mode selector. Listen, I'm no big city lawyer, but I feel like if a bunch of lights are fucking on, I, I'm I'm gonna assume that you know there's some serious issues happening. The, 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 like I feel yeah. like you don't ever want to hear it eh, 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 when you're literally flying a fucking plane. The degree of negligence is insane here. Like it is almost it's unfathomable how these pilots continued to climb and not descend. It is unfathomable because as a rookie pilot in me i would have been able to recognize this immediately immediately yeah i don't know what happened there like, i'm playing flight simulator and i know that alert when you hit that alert it as you're climbing that's a cabin altitude alarm 100 percent. i've hit it if you watch hoscord streams i've hit that uh, i've hit that many times you've also hit the top of the hour many times as well that's true cool that's crazy to which he received I feel like this is an no elaborate reply. scheme for Austin to get dropped off somewhere. <laughs> it's not the case. Alan didn't realize it at the time, but Hans was behaving strangely because he and his co-pilot were both suffering from rapid onset hypoxia. Oh, a maybe that's why they the were like is deprived yeah. of oxygen. YOLO. The effects of hypoxia on the human body strange. I'll be honest. At first, what? the this vision one of the dumbest slightly, fucking accidents. And then confusion the most, and disorientation like, begins Stupid to accidents that should have never fucking happened. It's just so insane that this has happened. Wait, so the, the guy on the ground asked, hey, like, can you check to make sure it's on auto? And then never found out what happened. Well, it's, yeah. I think at that point, they're, they're, in hypoxia, so they're probably not even like responding. What can you do in that situation? Descend put on your mask and put on and descend, descend quickly. No, I'm saying, what can the guys on the ground do? Because if they're not Yell responding at, to, at that to point, put on the mask. Yeah, and if they're yeah. not, if they're not responding though, it's too late, right? Yeah, they're dead. Yeah, yeah, they're unconscious. Quickly followed by a lack of coordination, and then a mood change, which for some can be extreme irritability, and for some euphoria. What is particularly terrifying about hypoxia is that one of the symptoms can be a disassociation from the self, meaning sometimes people cannot truly grasp what is happening to them. Because Hans and Pampos did not immediately put on their oxygen masks in response to the alarm, at 15,000 feet and climbing, these symptoms were coming on very quickly. And as they set in, 
a warning light, known as the Master Caution Light, came on to indicate that masks had now dropped inside the passenger cabin. Those masks were able to distribute approximately 12 minutes of oxygen per person, more than enough for a plane to descend to a safe and breathable altitude. This was yet another warning that something was wrong with the cabin pressurization system. That's really fucked up because that means that those people, the pilots had no idea what the fuck was going on, but those people that had the oxygen masks for all 12 of those minutes at the very least were completely aware of the uh, situation, freaking the fuck out inside of this As goddamn the plane tin was just can. climbing on autopilot. Yeah. I never realized there's a limit to the oxygen. Uh, yeah. Pilots, on pilots on the other hand, do not have a like. They, I mean, obviously they have a limit to their oxygen as well, but so it's much much larger, the, right? The gas masks that the pilots are using have oxygen tanks associated with them. Mm -hmm. They're yeah. independent. The, the passenger ones that fall drop down have a solid chemical that when you pull, it triggers it and, uh, and starts a chemical reaction, and so, and. That generates oxygen as a byproduct, and that's how that's what you're actually breathing. Yeah, and that's finite. I mean, it runs out after whatever twelve, 12 minutes, minutes, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even know that. That's not news to me. To be fair, though, yeah, they might have already lost a bunch of them. Probably lost consciousness before the ma uh, oxygen mass dropped, right? Or does it does it automatically? I mean, I would assume those that one drops automatically, right? As soon as the cabin pressure, or mm -hmm. is it because that's not manual? No, it's it's automatic. So I assume they weren't. Uh, losing consciousness yet. Once the cabin depressurizes it to a certain amount, it triggers them and they drop. Yeah, which is odd. Wait, so why would like, the... I, I've been in an airplane where the masks dropped and I had supplemental oxygen. Like, we knew that ahead of time, but, like, it's not that bad. You don't need to be on it when it drops. Wait, w w were you guys testing something? Uh, I was taking a delivery <laughs> flight of a 737-900ER for Turkish Airlines. And they just dropped them on purpose? Yeah, you put, like, lockouts on them, and okay. then you, like, test the system. It's a test flight. <coughs> oh, it's a test flight. I didn't know they tested those on the delivery flight. Well, they depressurize the cabin. Ah. It's all good, though, because um, they had Kurban. <laughs> you know what that is? Yeah. Can I talk about that part? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's one of my favorite stories. Okay. Deve. Okay, so... I've told Dude, you guys. Google, you can show pictures. I've told you guys this uh, before, but in Turkey uh, we have kurban bayrama, which is where you sacrifice an animal, right? And it's supposed to be like a, it's a big thing. And Turkish Airlines will also sacrifice an animal before they purchase a. F How you explain no. it? No. Okay. So Google apronda deve. Wait, there's a video of it. It's, it's bloody. Is that going to be a problem? No, it's fine. Deve kestirerek kutlatan Şükrü Can aylar sonra ilk kez bugün Did kameralar karşısındaydı. No, but I was there. Şükrü Can like, pek bir şey değişmemişti. After. Bir tek başkan vekili titri elinden alınmıştı Can'ın. Sitesi sahibine hakaret davası so, açan Şükrü right Can. So that airplane that they're showing is one of the Royal Jets. That's like the the brand of the uh, aircraft. Mm -hmm. And they were a nightmare to maintain apparently. So to celebrate the last one's lease like ending and departure they brought a camel in to to sacrifice and a camel is so there's like tears right there's tears of sacrifice yeah like it's like it, it, this what you do when you when you sacrifice an animal it's like culturally normal you you know you'll obviously feed your family but you also donate it to like less fortunate etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's like a communal giving too yeah i know it sounds a little brash especially in like you know western cultures but it's that's pretty common yeah. And you can have like different tiers of animals, right? Like a goat or a lamb is relatively small. It could probably feed a couple of families. Like that's pretty standard. And then like the camel is the biggest animal. Right? Yeah. So the camel like the tier, tier is the highest tier. Unless there's like some real freaks out there that like, like they, yeah, yeah, that like sacrifice an elephant or something. How can you even. Drink, uh, yeah, yeah, you like, uh, what, you... You have to, you have to kill the them. animal. Yeah, you have to blindfold the animal. You have to kill the animal with, like, one swift... Uh, I think they, like, cut of the blade? And then, like, cut one of the main arteries. Yeah, so, so like... They, like, they can't taint the meat. And, like, you also, like, you say some kind of prayer while you're doing it. I'm yeah, sure. so I don't, I don't even know you can do that would. for an elephant. I, dude, I have no idea. Yeah, that's, a, that's halal. And I think kosher as well. It's a very specific method. So Istanbul... Why can't they do like airport. lethal injection or something? No, no, no. no Bro, no, come no. on. It's a religious sacrifice. Oh, yeah, what are you talking about? 
<laughs> you can't do a lethal injection. Also, you you'd be tainting. You would literally be tainting the meat. Yeah, you want to like like <laughs> say prayers to them as you like bleed them out. Like what? Yeah. Um. <laughs> Um, anyway, they did this for the they did this uh, for the plane with a camel. Yeah, they brought a camel to the tarmac, the operon, and <laughs> they like th- there's like actual pictures of like the blood running through like the Ugh. the taxiways. Oh, that's so <laughs> they, they fucking. They sacrificed it on the plane. No, next to the plane, like on the tarmac. <laughs> Is this the news from it? Yeah. Yeah, that's the airplane. <laughs> that's the camera. That's so awesome. So, I, where they did this, I used to work at it. Uh, so, I would go in that gate where they brought the camel in every morning. And I'd have to, like, bring my, you know, your work stuff, right? Your laptop, your yeah. bag, whatever. You go through, like, a little security check. It is for and, good luck, yes, chatter. And I, I would, um, <coughs> I would bring this type of Turkish pastry, mm. like it's a börek that's plain, mm. and then you put powdered sugar on it. Mm. Oh yeah. But then you know, I was like, okay, I want to go bring some to my coworkers. I want to eat it there. So I would bring these like trays of börek with yeah. like these tiny little Ziploc bag with pow- powdered sugar in it. <laughs> like put it through the security. All right, let's go. Yeah, he was trafficking <laughs> cocaine, is what he's saying. All right, let's get back to the video. All right, let's get back to the video. But it was too late. Both pilots were now too impaired to understand what was happening, and they were unable to work through the problem logically. Instead, both pilots got distracted by the equipment cooling light, which came on because the onboard computer systems were not being cooled properly due to the inadequate pressurization. And it was this that both pilots chose to focus on in their increasingly hypoxic state. Hans believed that it could be fixed by a system reset, and down on the ground, Alan, still baffled, continued to ask Hans about the pressurization mode selector. Hans ignored him and demanded to know where the circuit cooling breakers were, to which Alan replied, behind your seat. 13 minutes after the flight took off, at 6.20 a.m., the line went silent. And Alan, confused but satisfied that he had answered all of the captain's questions, went home. At this point, passengers inside the cabin would have only had a few minutes of oxygen left. We can never know what happened in that cabin, but we can reasonably assume that there would have been panic and confusion. Following procedure, the cabin crew would have been seated, waiting for the pilots to perform an emergency descent to a safe altitude. Instead, the plane was on autopilot and was continuing its climb to 34,000 feet. All the while, the cabin crew would have been aware that the masks were fast running out of oxygen. We know As happened. the passengers and the crew were struggling in their last moments of consciousness, at 6.29am, the Helios dispatcher who initially took the call from Hans contacted ground control at nearby Nicosia airport. He stated that he hadn't been able to make further contact with Flight 522 for nine minutes. The dispatcher at Nicosia airport also failed to reach the cockpit, and at 6.36am, 16 minutes after last contact, Flight 522 began to enter Athens airspace and was handed over to Athenian air control. Over the next 40 minutes, the air control center team at Athens and several planes in the vicinity attempted and failed to make contact. Is it too dangerous to have like uh, some kind of mechanism that, uh, wait, I guess that's what the problem Would was. Would just send the, the plane on yeah. its own? Uh, does the Airbus do that? I don't know, but um, it definitely have its own complications right everything's subject to failure like there i feel like ghost planes is one of those uh one of those instances that happens more frequently than you would expect like this kind of situation i mean it's like Wasn't there's there so many very recently that happened and over the united states a private jet well that yeah, yeah but that's like <coughs> that's a little bit different i feel like because it's uh you know i also don't know what like hypoxia looks like where even if you brought it back um altitude like because the airplane is going to run out of fuel and it's going to lower itself right but even if you do supply you know oxygen at that point does it are they able to wake up and take control of the situation or it's like you're out of oxygen and you're dead yeah i think i think you would probably slowly come back to consciousness i but, mean but i mean but you the the idea that the, what's confusing is why the the situation that happened recently i don't know what plane what sort of alerts that plane has to 
make the pilots aware of their hypoxic state or whatnot. People are saying after three minutes of hypoxia, you die. Uh, or And then someone else said 20 minutes. I don't know what the exact number is, but... And I'm sure it depends <laughs> on who you are, like as far as your physique and your condition. Yeah, I mean, if you don't have any oxygen, you die. I know, but well, I'm saying like... you don't like, have no oxygen. Uh, above 10,000 feet, right, it's... You have... There are low oxygen levels and due to the pressure of the air, but there is still oxygen there. That also is a variable, right? Yeah, I'm just saying that... Shouldn't there be automatic systems that uh, set in place where if there's no contact for an extended amount of time, probably like the the 13 minute, I guess, window or or 12 minute window that like automatically starts descending down to an a uh, down to a a altitude where there is uh, down to an altitude where there is actually uh, breathable oxygen, and then. Uh, you, there, there's more hope for recovery at that point. The, this, the, so the, the philosophy bef- behind design of aircraft actually, or control of aircraft vary uh, between Boeing and Airbus. I and Austin, we'll talk about this a little bit too, where Airbus tries to put a lot more automation in, where mm-hmm. Boeing is a lot more manual, right? Mm-hmm. Boeing says the, the pilot, and that's, not, that's my opinion, not Boeing's, obviously, um, that the pilot is trained, the pilot is all-knowing, the pilot can command this aircraft to do whatever it needs to, right? So you can have multiple issues. I, I mean, I, I'm not familiar that much to, with aircraft, like control systems, but I can imagine a world where you're at elevation and you have a, you know, a fuel issue or an engine out issue that now you have to glide, but also you have a pressure issue, right? Now you're trying to trade different uh, failure modes and trying to get as much a, out of that aircraft as you can. And that's up to the pilot and the pilot's skill to, you know, make that a successful landing. But if you have the airplane overriding the pilot, that's a bad thing. I think in both Airbus and Boeing, in a cabin depressurization situation, the the, the procedure is pretty similar. Like you have, the pilots have procedures to follow. When that warning comes up, it's not like your car. Yeah, I mean, this like, is, oh this yeah, there's a check engine. Let me just do whatever. This is a failure on behalf of the pilots for sure. <laughs> I mean, they, completely... they just they they fucked up on numerous occasions. Obviously, there's like a, a redundancies there. But even after all things considered, I feel like it would. I don't know. the uh, the 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 idea is that the the failure should have been recognized, and then you would have descended quick enough where you wouldn't have even or just experienced these. Like, symptoms. it doesn't matter that everyone in the back might pass out, right? I mean, obviously, it does matter, but because <laughs> they're going to get their mask. You're going to go down the uh, to, you know, elevation. It's going to be okay. But, like, the pilots are the, the critical point. And they were the only I ones wonder, that weren't using their masks. Can we do, like, a, what if there was, like, a drone that could just, like, fly on top of the plane and then uh, get was in? It, was it the movie Air Force One where they use, like, a F-117 to, like, go underneath and, like attached to it i don't remember that yeah. but but you know you have fueling systems right you have like uh air refueling yeah air refueling systems in a similar capacity why don't they have like uh i mean you have data connection to the aircraft if you have you know modern that's what i mean systems, like why don't they just fly a drone on top of the I mean, cockpit i do need to do that you can you, just you can just simply just sa- sa- or you can just follow the procedure and descend well yeah that's step number one but by the way, what I'm saying is, uh, and they wouldn't be able what to. I'm saying they is wouldn't not be able that to sc- insane. No, they wouldn't be able to scramble something but quick why, enough. Why do you need a drone? Is the point we're making? It's like you already have a connection to the space uh, to the aircraft. <laughs> oh, you, so you're saying you can actually technically via satellite control an airplane if it's designed to do that? Sure, but but I feel like that is actually way less safe because then that could be hacked or something like that. Then it's like whatever, right? The whole idea is the pilot. Is that's why I said person a, who's there for response responsibility right the failure mode the failure system is the pilot when the light goes on it's telling the pilot hey something's wrong i know i'm saying it would be less susceptible to tampering if you could bring a very specific type of drone that manually connects immediately to the interface no latency whatsoever and can One, assume how control to the drone <laughs> two where is this drone coming from like launch what's the, what's the method of commu- communication between the drone and the aircraft when let's say you're using uh like just one of the regular drones right one how would you even connect you're gonna have to do it wirelessly to no, that you, drone you, itself is no you fly commanded. you okay here here's you what you do you already drone? have you already have multiple uh depending on what uh depending on what uh country it's flying over you already have like f-16s you bring something that can deploy a drone 
And then the co-pilot on the F-16 or whichever uh, plane it is, is the one who's basically utilizing the drone. So in order to eliminate uh, latency. So you're, I think you're missing the point. What are we trying to do here, folks? I just, I just think that it, it boils down to the pilot not descending the plane when they were supposed to. When they had the opportunity to. This is this is like this is this is baby shit. I mean, I'm not gonna speak ill of you know. the dead. Yeah, no, the it's Boeing baby. Seven thirty-seven Max had a Look, system I'm that not could speaking alter the, of the, the dead, ship. but I'd tell them when they're alive, it's baby shit. Yeah, the the uh, Boeing uh, seven thirty-seven Max's uh, uh, software failure caused the 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 planes to fall. I, I that was that was like an automatic. But that was a that was a system that was designed to prevent the plane from stalling. It overrode the pilot's input. Is the point? Yes, and and the Airbus has something similar. You cannot stall an Airbus. I mean, you can, but then the plane will the plane will automatically take over for you. Damn, dude! I used to say if it's not if it's not Boeing, I'm not going. But you're making an argument for that. No, 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 no. I think that for the Frenchman over here, I think that I personally, my opinion is that Boeing pilots generally are more skilled. I think that uh, I don't think that it's arguable. Airbuses are easier to fly. Like, actually physically fly them. They're easier. Because okay. the plane is... Over 30 calls were made across multiple frequencies. There was... Can you ask them why don't pilots just wear masks for the full flight? Uh, cost. And also, it would be a nuisance. I mean, like, don't forget, these guys are flying, you know, thousands of hours <laughs> Yeah, here, right? You would... Dude, that would be really <laughs> fucked up. Imagine. Hell no, brother. Dude, dude think about it. You're doing. Like you, have you ever done a fourteen? Wear helmets. And take the mask off. Yeah. Have you ever done a fucking fourteen-hour flight chatter? Like, can you imagine the pilot also having to wear a goddamn oxygen mask the entire remember, time? Remember during COVID when they were trying to make people wear just a mask and people were freaking out? Yeah. There's no shot that that would be uh, that would be sustainable. No one would do that. Nurses were wearing N95s. Yeah. This is not an N95. Okay. This is like. Also, supplemental oxygen. Yeah, this is literally not just an N95. This is straight up. It's like wearing a scuba. Like yeah, mask. nuisance versus death. I guess. Well, at that point, you have to also make a cost benefit analysis, and it's like given how, uh, given how most pilots are, tra all pilots are trained on this, and most pilots don't fuck this up. That that would be that would basically be a, a an over the top uh, uh, redundancy. Bro, a pilot announced that masks aren't required anymore for a flight and you can tell he's so excited saying that. Yeah, I know. That's the other part. Some of them are hogs too. YouTube pilots wear a mask for 12 plus hours. Yeah, there. how many YouTube pilots are there? In the yeah, world? I was going to say, did you just compare that to commercial uh, uh, jets, commercial jet pilots? Like they're just, that's insane. Yeah, astronauts, dude. Yeah, how about that? Oh, uh, Actually, astronauts take their... Uh, Helmets off too. Yeah, but it, it, you know, while not while they're fucking, you know, not while they're they're I they, getting out of orbit. I thought you said YouTube. Pilots. So when they when they're uh, during launch and reentry, they're wearing it, and I think they're during like EVA, right, wearing it, but not yeah. not when they're floating around in the ice. And the masks that they have in the cockpit are super fucking suffocating. Yeah. So when you yeah, whereas a whereas an astronaut helmet is not as suffocating. Well, kind of. You, right. I mean, the mask I mean, that you. Have there in the cockpit those two little red tabs they press yep it inflates the that go around the entire helmet head and um when Don't you release it about? will like it'll suck the mask into your face yeah because you want one size mask to fit anybody right so it's not meant made for comfort survival this is what they wear, by the way. I put, their... I put, I've put them on before. Survival. They're not very comfortable. You worn a YouTube pilot suit? No, I've episode. worn, I've worn an oxygen mask and the like the, the pilot ox oxygen mask. This is, bro. This Imagine is my, this is my plane. pilot dog. He's, he's going the up there, dude. The YouTube plane is pressurized. However, to ensure the safety and security Austin's of the pilots, the king of useless information. How about the information that I'm currently fucking your mom right now at this moment? Damn, Austin is straight. He just came out of straight fucking just to fuck your, your mother your mom. at this moment. Just to fuck your mom. How about that for use, useless information, you son of a bitch? From a mold, but thanks to the advance of technology, the making scans and 3D anthropometric are utilized. 
The suit also complemented with a specific helmet which is equipped with a tube connected to the feeding port in order to feed the pilot and help them stay hydrated. Truffle macaroni and cheese? Caution, do not use if tube is swollen. <laughs> Oof. Does that mean it's rotten? I have no idea, probably. Yeah. Steve MRE 1984 would tank that, though. He'd be like, I don't give it. Mmm, nice. I don't care. Um, Is it, is it also hard to just... The oxygen mask like you have to train for it right it's like wear it I mean, use the oxygen mask at all times right? like yeah look, look this guy's training before for it, the seems. takeoff this is principally to remove the nitrogen in the blood in order to reduce the risk of sickness made possible by decompression yeah every so, pilot dude simple every pilot has to a, a lot more common like application of this is with scuba diving and because like instead of low pressure you're you're going high pressure under uh under the water levels right so the, the pressure of the air that you're breathing and the concentration of the different chemicals in it changes, right? And, um, like, there's different things you can do. Like, they uh, purge all the nitrogen out of your system in case that there is a, an emergency situation. Like, that delta rush doesn't, like, knock you out or whatever. But, I mean, these are super complicated things that you can't just, like, account for by wearing a mask all the time. Yeah. Also, Makes like, sense. imagine you have to carry that amount of uh, pressurized air with you all the time. That'd be insane, too. Every chat over the CPAP for apnea is basically a YouTube pilot? Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, let's get back to this video. Of course. Radio silence. Flight 522 still looked as if it was operating as normal. Oh, he did eat it. teams on the ground to theorize that there was an issue with the onboard radio system. At 7.20 a.m., Flight 522 began what looked like a standard approach procedure, but Air Control watched on in utter astoundment as the plane began to slowly turn back around in the same direction. I already said pilots of the tram, but you don't read woman chats? Wait, first of all, Alaska Airlines, uh, uh, Andy, I did read all of your chats. You were talking about pilots having, having to be trained for hypoxia training, which we also covered. Maybe your misinjury is showing, okay? Maybe, perhaps, your misinjury caused you first of all never accuse me of not reading a chat because i read everything so that's number one number two we did cover it we already had talked about it that's why i didn't uh mention it again so perhaps misandry is when women do misogyny well not misogyny misandry like like misogyny but the other way around it's okay i'm, I'm fucking so around and that it came entering what is known as an automated holding pattern as part of its missed approach procedure over the Greek island of Kea. Oh, interesting. And it was here that Flight 522 stayed, flying around on a repeated loop. At this point, teams on the ground knew that something was desperately wrong. By 8.23 a.m., the I don't understand how there's literally no circumstance where it just, like, automatically triggers, uh, like, a water landing or something. But okay, water landing is insanely dangerous. It's okay. also insanely difficult. There's no way a plane can just fucking land itself, right? On a on a regular uh, airport. Sure. Tarmac. Yeah, of course. They, they do it all the time. But they had to be programmed that way. Okay. It, there's a lot of different... One, we need to be comfortable enough as a society with airplanes landing themselves w without pilots. Right? That's, that's a huge one. <laughs> Two, the aircraft has to be equipment with that equipment, which, I mean, back in 2005... Case. Right. Airliner technologies, airplane technologies increased that much since 2005? No. It's, it, uh, the, the, well, I, I, you're, you're talking about an airplane that was designed in like, I don't know, the 70s, 80s. Yeah, that's why I'm saying, like, I'm shocked. I, I, w I would say this. I bet the technology has probably increased dramatically since 2005, but our comfort with it has not. So we're, we're the same comfort level. So the design and functionality of these planes are the same as they were. I love people saying, okay, why trains? Dog. It, it literally flew it out of Cyprus. <laughs> like, this is the one circumstance where it's like what you're describing is like not physically impossible, but would be incredibly costly and not really all that worth it regardless. Uh, there's also a lot of political uh, issues with that as well. But planes auto land all the time. They just have pilots that are putting in the uh, like inputs. they're configuring it, yeah. Configuring the auto land and everything, and they're monitoring the plane. And they have to initiate like the process, but the airport has to be like equipped for it. The airplane has to be equipped for it. The mm -hmm. conditions have to be right. The airplane has to be in good shape. But the uh, I think all commercial airliners are, for the most part, are all equipped with this Autoland technology. And 
pretty much all major airports too. So like, like if, if you sit up close enough to the cockpit, you'll hear the autopilot disconnect on final approach. Most, 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 most of the time they're not flying it fully visual. Um, By the way, people keep saying trains remain undefeated, but like trains have accidents all the time, right? So you'll hear this. Hold on. If you're sitting close enough to the cockpit in a plane, listen for this on a Boeing. Oh, that's Airbus. This is Airbus. So you'll hear an, it's a, in an Airbus, you'll hear this. That's the autopilot disconnecting. So you'll hear that in an Airbus. And then a Boeing is like. Um, that's Boeing. Yeah, we could have gotten through like five minutes of this fucking video. The Hellenic Air Force no, you couldn't have, contacted because and two not, with your, uh, not with your aircraft, not with your reactions. Okay. <coughs> Just nine minutes later, uh, at eight thirty-two a.m., the two F-16 pilots described the disaster that right, was about, about to this? unfold before everyone's eyes. Teams on the ground listened in horror as they were told that First Officer Pampos Haralambos was slumped over the control panel and Captain Hans Jürgen Merton was nowhere to be seen. Later, they would find out that he had passed out, searching for the switch behind his seat. No one was flying that plane. The two F-16 pilots went on to describe how all passengers were sat completely motionless, with their oxygen masks dangling uselessly above them. I saw two passengers on the left side of the aircraft. That's they were so sat motionless in their seats and were wearing oxygen masks on their faces. That's when I saw additional oxygen masks dangling from the passenger's overhead units. Even though the passenger cabin was dark, I could see the shadow of the oxygen hoses and masks against the daylight shining through the windows on the other side of the passenger cabin. Oof. The emergency level was now set to the highest possible as rescue teams on the ground attempted to make sense of this horrifying new information. And then, at 8.49 a.m., also, during that the plane plane's didn't have holding pattern, I don't know why. See, the F-16 now, now pilot doing what observed someone does. slowly making their way to the cockpit. The person put on a pair of headphones and placed their hand on the controls in front of them. But just one minute later, the left engine stopped working due to fuel deprivation, and the plane, all of a sudden, Wait, what? began Wait, to rapidly descend. What? The following conversation is recorded between the two F-16 pilots. Wait, 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 wait. What, what do you mean? Wait, what? Wait, wait, wait what? what happened? There's like a guy that just somehow tanked it? What the fuck? At 8.49 a.m., during the plane's 10th holding pattern, the F-16 pilot observed someone slowly making their way to the cockpit. The person put on a pair of headphones and placed their hand on the controls in front of them. No but fucking just way. Later, no fucking stopped way. Work. I don't believe it. How would they have tanked that level of oxygen deprivation? No way. That late in the pro- No way. Like, There's no way. So they fucking. There's so, no way somebody just. It was one woke of the up. flight attendants. They had an oxygen tank. Oh. Oh, cabin crew gets oxygen tank. Um, maybe I don't know, but <clears throat> um, why did they wait so long? It's been an hour and a half. Maybe they couldn't get the door open. This is post nine eleven, so the door was like ballistic, and they finally broke it open after like. I don't think you can. Break I don't think you can break a ballistic door with, on the flight. But don't don't they have a code? Now they do, but maybe then I don't know. It's a, it's like small airline. I don't know their procedures. Yeah, but it's also foreign. They might not have. I know. The I know a lot of U.S. airlines. The lead flight attendant has a key to the cockpit. If they have a key, why didn't they start it before him? They explain if you watch the video. Oh, they explain it. Okay. Wait, what do you mean? King, due to fuel deprivation, and the plane all of a sudden really began to rapidly when they, when they descend. Swap, swap the following the conversation is recorded between the two F-16 uh, what do you mean? pilots and the rescue teams on the ground. Uh, uh, it's at this point that they realize that the person in the cockpit is Andreas Pedromu, one of the flight attendants who agreed to fill in for a sick colleague at the last moment. Andreas, investigators would later find out, was a qualified pilot, and it appeared that he was controlling the plane. But he had no training on a Boeing 737, and the plane was now rapidly losing altitude at a rate of around 1,500 feet per minute. The F-16 pilots desperately tried to make visual contact, but Andreas was not responding. So he was alive. Yeah, but at that point, 
plane had no fuel. At that point, not only did the plane had no fuel, but even if he successfully landed, everyone would be dead, right? Except him. I have no idea. Yeah, he would. He would. Dude, it would have been an hour without fucking oxygen. They would have all died. Every single passenger in the, at that situation would have died. God, what an eerie sight! That like. If he survived, he would have survived, but everybody else but would have also, been. Also, like, what a weird. Oh man, I'm sure if it was just regular conditions, landing a plane that you're not familiar with must be hard enough. And then coming out of hypoxia. Yeah, I would have been able to do it, but yeah, uh, no, you okay, wouldn't. Austin. I would have been able to land that plane. I words, promise you, Mayday, land that plane. Mayday, Mayday. This is Helios. <laughs> um. Oh, intelligent. People get incredibly confused within seconds of hypoxia. It happened with a lot of my COVID patients. They'd often tear their ox, uh, O2 BiPAP mass off in confusion and sometimes collapse, just die from just that. The piles would be dead probably even if you could control it remotely. Their hearts are going to stop. What do you have to say to that, Austin? Well, Austin's like, I, I would have had oxygen. a resident I'm nurse. Saying, if I, if I would have had oxygen on me. No, I'm saying like if you have hypoxia. Oh, no, I, I would have fought through the symptoms. Oh, okay. Los Airways Flight 522 was weakly spoken into the cockpit radio, which was set to the wrong frequency. These recordings would later be recovered from the crash site. But as the plane was going down, Andreas was speaking into the void. Think great. Oof. Think great. Terrain, terrain. Oof. Think great. Think great. Terrain, terrain. Pull up, pull At 8.59am, the right engine on the plane gave out. At this point, Andreas looked directly at the F-16 pilot, slowly lifted his hand, and weakly pointed downwards. Don't they still... I mean, I guess if he was a... Uh proficient in this specific plane and he if he was um how did he figure out how did he get in the cockpit and why did it take him so long all things considered if he if he knew how to uh land a specific plane one engine failure uh, due to having no fuel does well, not mean not, he can't land the plane yeah but but the, this was the, the both of them were flaming out because they were uh <clears throat> they were just the, the other one was going to flame out too can't you can't you literally land a plane with both of the engines uh uh, even if both of the engines have failed, uh, due sure. To, if, you, if you're self-conscious and or, that's what I mean, but like yeah, I mean, I that's the it. problem there is that at that point, oh, that's what I would have done. But it, at that point, if he was trained on this specific plane, he would have been able to actually just glide down. I mean, it's possible, and I would have done it. But it's aren't it's, pilots it's difficult? No, in order to become a commercial airline pilot, don't you literally need to? Yeah, but like know yeah, how to glide. But it's yeah. not always possible within a certain range and all this other stuff right and there yeah. are checklists checklists in place but if you have no familiarity with the aircraft you're just staring at a bunch of buttons yeah, it's very unlikely that he would have been able to land the plane the plane's descent was happening so quickly that the teams on the ground were struggling to keep up. 1,500 feet per minute. Uh, Fucking son of a bitch. At 9 hours, 3 minutes, and 32 seconds, Flight 522 collided with the rolling hilly terrain just outside of Gramatico Village at 400 miles per hour, causing a fireball that instantly raised several acres of land to the ground. All 121 people on board lost their lives instantly. Unex Several were members of the same family, 
Some were couples who went on holiday, leaving their children with their parents. Oh. Reports would later show that most passengers were alive, but unconscious. After the wild speculation amongst the media subsided, Fuck. a 186-page air accident investigation report was written. This report cited multiple failures to recognise the cabin pressurisation issues as they arose on the day, but they also revealed an ineffective and dangerous organisational culture that bent the rules beyond recognition. Always. In the absence of all but the last hour of the cockpit voice recorder, one question is often asked about Helios Flight 522. Why did the cabin crew not immediately enter the cockpit? Mm. And if they oh, did, yeah. why did they not make contact with teams on the ground over the radio? This is especially puzzling considering that they had access to several hours of oxygen, as well as, clearly, the cockpit access code. Even oh, the report itself states that it is rather puzzling. But perhaps the on-plane oxygen system can give us a clue. Because of the way the emergency oxygen system works on a plane, it's likely that the adult passengers would have run out of oxygen first. The crew had access to four emergency oxygen cylinders, and we know that three of them were used. But how, and in what manner, is unclear. Is it possible that some of the cabin crew may have attempted to share their masks with, say, one or several of the flight's younger passengers? If this did happen, this would have created an extremely dangerous situation, because at 34,000 feet, the effects of hypoxia set in at around 30 seconds, making the window for what is referred to as useful consciousness very short indeed. Perhaps, in order to help other passengers, the crew inadvertently incapacitated themselves. Isn't that why they always say, put your mask on first? Mm -hmm. Like, do not put your, like, if you're on an airplane, they say, put your mask on first before attending to your children. Katsu? Yeah. I literally gave you a 30-minute window. I asked you multiple times if you wanted to fucking eat. Okay, now I'm hungry. The food Bro, that I was, was pissed. All right, well, the video's over, so I'm you guys can leave after Perhaps this was want. done in the time that their own masks ran out That's crazy. on their way to the emergency oxygen cylinders. Or perhaps Andreas incapacitated himself, food. helping his partner. These Eating are, of course, just so theories, rude. because ultimately, we will never know. <laughs> Helios Airways continued operations until November 2006, but sustained massive losses and eventually went out of business. Unacceptable. In 2007, several families of those who died in the crash sued Boeing for 76 million euros. The lawyer leading the case highlighted that having the same alarm in place for two different types of dysfunction, uh. one relatively minor and the other with potentially devastating consequences, was <laughs> negligent. All part it's wild that that was the case to begin with, to be fair. Like, that does seem insane. Parties ended up settling out of court. And then, in 2000... Remember, that's why I always say, all matter of regulation is written with blood. That's the ink that they use to set new regulations. It's blood. In an eight, four Helios officials, including Alan Irwin, were charged with manslaughter, and after a complicated legal battle with the Greek courts, were all eventually found guilty in April 2012. By Wait, 2000 whoa! Wait, what? That's awesome. Who was found guilty? The bosses that work at the company. Oh. That. Wait a minute. It's a fat Greek W right there. I would never... Dude, in the United States of America, that is an unimaginable situation. Absolutely unimaginable situation. 